Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching another episode of the WeVA podcast. I'm super excited to dive into matryoshka representations. We have an all-star cast to dive into this. Uh, firstly, I'm joined by my WeVA colleague, Zane Hassan. Uh, Zane posts these amazing paper summaries on Twitter X and does all sorts of things at WeVA from traveling around the world to give talks, uh, the WeVA workshops, and so much more. Zane, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Hey everybody, super awesome to be here. Um, you know, read read some of these academic papers, but it's not every day that you get to talk to the author. So when Connor asked me whether I wanted to be part of this podcast, it was a no brainer for me. Great to be here. Amazing. And so I'm so excited to welcome Aditya Kusapati, the lead author of Matryoshka Representations. Uh, Aditya, you've been on my wish list for We V8 podcast for a long time. And uh, when Zane posted his analysis of Matryoshka Representations, I thought, awesome, we have a good uh, in of sending some research that we've done. So Aditya, you've done so much amazing work, not only in Matryoshka Representations, but in Approximate Nearest Neighbor Search. I'm so excited to welcome you to the podcast. Yeah. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Zane. Uh, yeah, it's good to be uh, here. Um, yeah, it's it's nice to see that um, uh, matriarchal representations are gaining traction. Uh, uh, in the last couple of years, it's been an uphill battle, but it's good to see that uh, people are finding it valuable at this point. Awesome. And we're also joined by Zach Nussbaum. Uh, Zach's a machine learning engineer at Nomic AI. So I think we have such an exciting combination of this academic background with, uh, I want to say industries. Sometimes I personally don't like that, like academic industry, like they're two separate things. But I think we have Zach and Nomic who are delivering these embedding models. And so I'm so excited to welcome Zach to the podcast and get your perspectives on training these models, wrapping them in an inference API and all these kind of things. Zach, thank you so much for joining. Yeah, yeah, super excited to be here, and uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. So, uh, Zach, could you maybe kick us off with uh, your thoughts on Matryoshka representations and supporting them in the Nomic embeddings? Yeah, yeah, awesome. So, uh, you know, we released, uh, I think, around uh, two weeks ago, uh, the first uh, open source uh, long context model that uh, outperforms uh, a few of the open AI uh, text embedding models. Um, and so the, the obvious next extension was, uh, you know, when people want to use these models in production, uh, you know, the embedding dimension, it can be a big blocker, right? Uh, especially if you have a larger embedding dimension, like the genomic embed model is at 768, a big, a big blocker is like actually storing each vector. Um, so if you have, you know, millions or, you know, tens of millions, uh, you know, th these can add up very quickly. So we, we were, you know, super excited to, you know, uh, implement uh, Matryoshka embeddings. Uh, Ditya and, and his team did, did some really great work. The paper was awesome. The code was super easy to read. So it was, it was such an easy port um, over to our code base and, and to get going. So yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a great blend of, you know, taking some some research and applying it to, to our, you know, industry and, and actually seeing some results very quickly. Amazing. Uh, so Ditya, could we uh, keep the ball rolling and could you tell us about... Uh, maybe what kicked off this research and maybe just a whole overview of the project? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is actually not from the paper. Like the 2022 paper was an afterthought. Um, I wrote a paper in 2021 on learning binary codes, which will double as uh, representation search indices. So uh, that was a step towards end-to-end -end differentiable search. Uh, it's a long way to go. I mean, the differentiable search index paper, neural corpus indexer, a lot of them made strides towards it, but not everything was fully differentiable. But this is something which was completely differentiable. When I was training them, the goal of the project was to take an image and embed it into, like, say, a 20-bit binary code. Uh, I also wanted to see how does it perform if I make it 30-bit? How does it perform if I make it 40-bit? Uh, and this was in 21. Uh, we had a 28 TTI machine. It used to take me two days to train on ImageNet with ResNet. Uh, I didn't want to wait for three different runs to finish. So what I did is I nested these codebooks and said the 40-bit 40 40 codebook is what I will be training for, but the first 30 bits should form the 30-bit codebook and the first 20 bits of the 30 bits should be forming the 20-bit codebook. And that was it. And this was written as a passing argument uh, in the 2021 paper. The paper is Learning Low-Dimensional Binary Codes. Uh, it was in the last paragraph. If anyone wants to go and look at it, like that tells you everything you know, need to know about matriarchal representations. And then, yeah, like I forgot about it. Uh, I went to Google to test out this uh, binary code embeddings at Google scale. Uh, 
because of course like you would be saving so much in storage if if you can do this and if there is no index uh, to be built and if everything is a hash function it would be super easy for you to implement a lot of these things uh, while I was exploring these things, I realized the pain point in Google with the dimensionality aspects of it as well. So I I just wanted to prototype it uh, at Google scale. So we had some results at UW already. Uh, uh, and then I prototyped it at Google scale. It just worked as if uh, it was a baseline model without any hyperparameter tuning. And the end result was you had a bunch of low dimension embeddings for free. And that's how everything started. So we wrote the paper for NeurIPS that year. Uh, yeah. And after that, the, the paper actually talks about uh, how to use this for large scale search. Uh, and we call it adaptive retrieval. Uh, in hindsight, it is a bit uh, uh, suboptimal. You cannot do it the way we talked about in the paper. So the idea was use the, say, if you have a 128 dimension embedding, use the 32 dimensions for shortlisting. So out of a billion documents, get like 100,000. And then on this 100,000, use the 128 dimensions and do re-ranking. Uh, while in principle, it looks interesting. There is a lot of systems considerations which we throw out of uh, uh, the window because all this 100,000 need not be co-located when you scale it up to uh, uh, a trillion scale documents. So your communication costs will just... Uh, blow up. So in order to alleviate that, you would like these things to be uh, incorporated with approximate nearest neighbors, which kind of handle this out of the box. So approximate nearest neighbors take systems consideration. So we wanted to make approximate nearest neighbors be aware of Matryoshka representations. That's how we came up with this paper called ADANS or Adaptive Approximate Nearest Neighbors. So that, that went into adaptive search through nearest neighbors, uh, like actual systems implementation. So this is in the embedding space, and we also realized the same thing can be applied in encoder space. Uh, so we also did that, like uh, that's a paper which was out last year. It's called Matryoshka Transformer. So yeah, uh, the same idea is rehashable and reusable at scale, and that's that's where it is. Amazing. So I, there's just so much to dive into this. I love the combination of the Matryoshka representations with new kinds of indexes. It really reminds me of kind of the Colbert re-ranking as well. Colbert, I always <laughs> get that pronunciation, Colbert, Colbert, but of that kind of short listing with the pooled vector to re-rank with the document vectors. And so I see kind of a lot of similarity in the philosophy here with how you might uh, uh, initially retrieve with the uh, lowest precision representation mm -hmm. and then bring in longer embeddings. Um, so maybe diving in a little further, my first question would be, and I think this would be a great one for Zach as well, who's been training these models is, is yeah, like how does the loss function change? Uh, are these harder to optimize than, st than standard embeddings? Okay, so the I, loss function is pretty straightforward. Let's, let's take an embedding model, which is trained with your favorite loss function. It can be contrastive, uh, however you want to train with negative um, uh, uh, negative examples, we do not care about that. So let's say you have a dimensionality of say 768 as Zach mentioned, and that's what Bert uses a lot of the time. Uh, instead of just optimizing for 768, all I'm going to do is like chunk out the first 384 dimensions and also the first 192 dimensions. And I'm going to compute the same loss at both of these granularities. So the nice thing about this is if you're doing something like contrastive loss, your 192 dimensional loss is a subset of 384. So it's additive, like you just need to add the rest of the stuff uh, into th to get the 384 dimensional loss. And further, you have to just add the rest of the 384 to get the 768. Um, while this is not how we implemented initially, but like this is very uh, uh, compute reusable format you can use for a lot of these uh, self-supervised objectives. And that's pretty much it. It doesn't matter what objective you're using. Uh, I'd often, at least in my experience, the base hyperparameters just work. In case they don't work, what you would ideally do is you could play with your learning rate. But another way of solving this is you only do not want your highest dimension embedding to lose in performance because everything else is for free. So you can, you can reweight your loss such that your highest dimensionality matches your performance of your baseline and everything else, whatever comes is for free. And coming to the hardness in training, compute cost doesn't add up. Uh, it's it's rarely, unless like we make a very terrible uh, uh, naive implementation, it should not be more than 5% overhead at any cost. Um, uh, the place where it starts to fail is 
if you go to say like something like 12 dimensions or like six dimensions you want to optimize in, in the 760 dimensions so the loss is loss to optimize for the six dimensions or 12 dimensions is so hard in textual space because there's so much information that that will destabilize the entire process it might not be like you're going to be far away from the baseline but you'll be like one to two percent away from the baseline which is bad uh, because that's not what you're looking for so only when you optimize for very low dimensionalities that's when it starts to uh, get affected otherwise it just works fine uh, and the loss function also need not be the same in case you want to do a multitask kind of loss say your 192 dimensions optimizes for some other process like maybe a retrieval aware loss 384 optimizes for classification and 768 optimizes for robustness you can do that uh, the only thing is we don't know the right hyperparameters for each of these things so we might have to be a bit careful but that is completely doable Now, this is this is super interesting, actually. Um, one, I guess, uh, follow up question I had here was, if you if you're not losing anything, and you mentioned this in the original paper, um, you've shown that the three eighty four dimensional representation is just as good as a separately trained three eighty four dimensional representation, and that uh, all the other dimensions are just as good. Um, is there really any reason not to do this? Uh, I would like to be proved wrong here, but until now, I haven't seen a case where it, it fails. I mean, like, see, if, if I only did this at uh, UW scale, I would have been skeptical myself. It works at Google scale. It works at OpenAI scale. So I don't know. I, I really don't know. I would like to be proved wrong somewhere like here because I actually did a bunch of experiments in MRL paper to see if the few short stuff goes bad, robustness goes bad. Yeah, it's 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 very weird. Like it it just doesn't like it feels like neural par neural networks are so overparameterized that yeah, I can offer to do this reorganization of information and it still works fine. Maybe maybe Zach is training something so he, he can he can add to how he is feeling about it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think you you put it uh, pretty well in, in that like the the baseline hyperparameters just work. Um, we 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 basically don't lose any performance when we're we're fine tuning our models um, using this loss. Um, the training speed is like roughly the same. Um, so there's a lot of like really cool benefits to having it, uh, like Aditya explained already. Um, we we even we did try to you know loss uh, you know uh, implement different weights for for different dimensions um, you know maybe we want to have like a higher loss on you know uh, the seven sixty eight dimension but we really didn't find like a big improvement um, or you know a, a good trade off like we we would have maybe slightly better performance on the higher dimensions but like much much worse uh, performance on the lower dimensions so on just the you know equal weighting seemed to work pretty well. Amazing. So I, I have a couple. I have a couple more questions about the details of the training and the details of the embeddings. But I quickly want to touch on the data set curation. And this is mostly a question for well, question for both. <laughs> but like, uh, I kind of want to kick it off with Zach because you know, as you're bringing this embeddings product, I'm really curious what your uh, you know experience is with you know building a big data set for training embeddings. Are, are we using like Wikipedia or maybe the colossal corp? Corpus, the C4, the hero of all deep learning. Uh, so what's kind of been the, <laughs> the experience of building the data set? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, the long story short is that it really makes or breaks your model. I think most of the work that I spent or the most, most of the improvements that I, that I saw were just, you know, data work or, you know, spending time looking at the data, spending time cleaning and curating the data. Um, uh, but yeah, so for, for training these, these embedding models, there's you know, usually two stages. One is this like large scale, like contrastive pre-training, and then there's this uh, smaller scale uh, contrastive fine tuning. So on the large scale uh, pre-training, you get a large of uh, a large collection of uh, paired documents. And, you know, that kind of vague, but like in, in most cases that ends up being like questions and answers or, um, you know, on like a Reddit thread, it'd be like a comment and then a, a reply to that comment. So two, two, two sentences that are, you know, semantically related. Um, and uh, I think we curated around 240 million pairs of these data sets um, or uh, uh, sentences. Um, and it's across, you know, many, many different um, uh, domains. Um, 
And then for the fine tuning, uh, where you kind of get the next level of performance, oh, oh, this is where I did spend a lot of time as well, which is, you know, finding, uh, basically you have your, your, uh, your pairs as well. And then you also uh, add in some hard negatives. So, uh, th- which is super important for retrieval performance. So this is like your question and answering, um, and then you also add in some ne- uh, hard negatives that are, you know, maybe lexically or semant- like somewhat semant- semantically similar to other documents, um, but just helps aid in, you know, pushing the model um, performance a little bit more. Uh, so, Aditya, what would you, what would be your reaction to that with your data set curation? I mean, I I really never care about data sets because I just use whatever people give me. So that's what. That's like I, I I I understand data is the most important thing, but at this point, like my fair comparison is I don't care what data set you give. I just need to match the performance, and that's pretty much where I was focused on. Uh, so yeah, that's that's it. And what Zach said makes a lot of sense. I am pretty sure a lot of the companies right now uh, have the pre-trained models, which are pretty good. Uh, but they're going to fine tune with same Matryoshka. But uh, something which people forget is you can pre-train with Matryoshka. Uh, it's it's a one-time cost and like it just remains there and you can do so much more adaptation to it. It's just that uh, the nice thing is with NF data, fine-tuning just works for Matryoshka, but you need slightly more data. So maybe I can give you an example. If you try to do MS Marco without any extra data with uh, a BERT pre-trained model, uh, uh, Matryoshka representation loses like 0.5 MRR and it's very hard to recover it back without extra data because there is limited data and the pre-training run pretty much set the embedding space in such a way that it's very hard. So as Zach was mentioning, now nowadays it's actually like three stages. There is a pre-training, there is a pre-fine uh, tuning where you continue the pre-training with some domain-specific data. You should probably do Matryoshka at that point, and then the fine-tuning, if you do not have enough data, will still be fine. If you have enough data for fine-tuning, as he said, like if you have 240 million, that's a lot of data, and yeah, it just works. Um, I mean, like uh, ImageNet is a good enough example. ImageNet scale, it works. I think anything smaller than ImageNet, it starts to struggle, and anything larger than ImageNet, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty much slam dunk. It just knows what to learn and uh, yeah uh, like data is important like so think about it this way you need enough data points for it to warp the space so it's it's no more a spear it's a spear within a spear within a spear so think of them as like three levels of spears and it's actually the matryoshka levels of spears and i mean i don't know how nomic is going to visualize it i really want to visualize it at some point but i think there was this tweet by Dhruv Anand. I don't know that person personally, but uh, he showed that the variance of performance just drops significantly at every single stage and it's a step function. That actually shows you the the uh, diameters of your spear if you think about it kind of that way, the volumes of your spears. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. Let yeah. me get one more question on this one really quick. I think we're now kind of transitioning into, uh, you know, the stages of training with this kind of the sphere visualization, but I just have one more question on data set curation. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on synthetic queries using the LMs to produce synthetic queries? I have to think that that would improve these data sets significantly, especially if you're trying to, and maybe this does transition us into the topic of stages of fine tuning, but I imagine a lot of like we've eight users, particularly you have a corpus of say your particular software documentation, but you don't like have enough questions. What do you think about synthetic queries to enhance these data sets? I, I think yeah. uh, I have limited knowledge on this. Zach is the right person. Again, it's, it's a good data is good. More data is better. I have no other comments than that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so this is actually something that we we played around with uh, a little bit uh, when we were training Nomic in bed. Uh, we, we tried to both do basically generate a query, a document, and a negative, or just like given a document, generate questions. Um, and it seems to work okay, and I think it works really well when you don't have any data in the in the domain. Um, but, you know, there's there's... I guess I wish I had more time to work on just like curating the data set. This was kind of like a one week effort. Um, what I found was that a lot of the time um, the diversity wasn't enough to push the performance, you know, when compared mm-hmm. to like a, like a manually curated data set. 
Um, you know, granted, I was using, uh, I think, Mistral or Mixtral at the time. So maybe there's like a performance gap between that and, uh, you know, uh, GPT-4. Um, so that's another confounder that, that would be really cool to investigate. But, um, but yeah, I, I think it's great if you have literally no data. But I think there, there's if you have some data, um, I think uh, you, you might be better off at the time. But, but I mean, there's, there's tons of papers that, that are conflicting with what I'm saying. There's like a paper called, I think, Inpars and Propagator. There's that new Mistral E5 paper that did uh, a bunch of synthetic data. So, um, you know, there, I think there's a lot, a lot of evidence for, for it that it should work and it should work well. Yeah, I have to quickly plug also in the in pairs promptigator, there is UD, UDAPDR that kind of builds with this DSPI framework of like synthetic data creation. Yeah, so I'm just so interested in that topic. But uh, so transitioning back, uh, Zane, I know you have some questions about kind of extending pre-trained models with this kind of thing. Do you mind maybe taking yeah. the mic on? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, just one comment on the use of synthetic data. So that paper that Zach was mentioning where they, um, they trained... Um, the Mistral 7 billion um, to, and, and then it uh, hit the top of the MTEB benchmark there. They basically took, I think, like 200,000 or 300,000 synthetically generated um, uh, pairs, and then they trained uh, the 7 billion model uh, on this, and it performed quite well. So I think there is definitely something there. Like, mm-hmm. I, I read a paper about the, uh, the, you know, the false promise of synthetic data, and then I see all of these <laughs> different... Um, uh, publications and tweets around, oh, we use synthetic data to do this and this. Um, so it's super interesting. Um, well, okay, the let's stay is, on. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. uh, I didn't know if you were going to transition the topic back to the pre-training thing, because now I think we've opened the synthetic data <laughs> can of worms. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. That, that, pap- that paper you're referencing, isn't that like, um, as Zach did the hands up in our Zencaster, and that's the first time anyone's ever used the hands up in the we- in the history of the Weave Gate podcast. <laughs> oh, uh, really? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, like, uh, yeah, let me, let me just give it right to you, Zach. Oh, yeah. I, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, our, you know, slight negative point, I don't, I don't think... Uh, I don't think we should be misconstruing that that we we aren't bullish on synthetic data. I think it's it's a really cool opportunity, and it's uh, obviously there, there's a lot of good evidence for it. It's just like I don't think we spend enough time on it. Um, but but yeah, that's all I wanted to to clarify. Yeah, I, and I, so Zane, that paper that you're citing, I think if I understand that paper correctly, that's about like language modeling data that comes out of language models, correct? Yeah. So I, I believe they took synthetic data from uh, GPT-4 and then they used those examples to train or fine-tune a, a Mistral 7 billion specifically for information retrieval. Oh, okay. And they found negative results with that? And They found great results with that, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so it, it performed quite well. I, I think it's second on the MTEB benchmark right now um, as uh, after that fine-tuning. But... Um, it was quite interesting because the whole, uh, the only thing they did is um, is fine tune with synthetic data in that paper. So, hmm. yeah, I just think that there's like, ugh, man, the thinking about how do I curate my synthetic query data set really interests me a ton. Yeah, and, I, and especially as you talk about like kind of hard negative mining, or because I guess maybe another synthetic query is a is a like maybe even a synthetic negative document perhaps and. I always also like thinking about the prompts for how you produce a query. Like maybe I should retrieve the top three documents to this query and the prompt should be like, please make sure this query would only be answered by the first. And I emphasize only because that would be all caps in the prompt. <laughs> only be answered by the first by the first passage and not the other two. So, so yeah, I, I just think that whole thing is so, such an interesting topic, synthetic queries for training IR models. Uh, anyway, so, so Zane, can we transition back to um, this, this question on uh, can we take embedding models off the shelf, like maybe all mini LM and then sort of resurrect it, add, add Matryoshka to it. Yeah. So one of the great things I liked about the paper was the, you expressed this in the paper, the ease with which you could adapt MRL to, uh, to pre-existing like training frameworks, but then also take any embedding model and you could fine tune it a little bit with this uh, kind of aggregated loss function. And then you would you would turn any model into an MRL uh, embedding embedding model. So can you talk a little bit more about that process and how easy it is to do that? I mean, like uh, it, like from an image perspective, it's pretty rare that we do this because like I'm okay. So maybe for some context, 
I do not work in tech space. Uh, I'm a machine learning person with some vision uh, uh, inclination. So all of my experiments typically are in vision space. And in vision space, typically, like, it's good. Just We, we just do an end-to-end training of ImageNet. Everything is well and good. Uh, however, in tech space, uh, after knowing that there is pre-training, pre-fine-tuning, and fine-tuning, it should be very straightforward with enough data for you to just just do it, uh, do a simple fine-tuning run on each of these things and with, with Matryoshka loss, and it just works fine. And even in vision space after that, like I started training things on pre-trained ImageNet 21K models, like much larger 21 million images, and then I used to adapt them to ImageNet 1K much, much quickly with Matryoshka loss. So that's, that's good as well. Uh, uh, I think the paper talks about unfreezing just like a couple of layers and like fine tuning it for a few epochs, like 10 to 20 epochs and you get, get back the structure, which is highly doable. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's not at all complicated. Like, I think it's, it's very easy to get it to work. One thing I haven't tried or I haven't seen people try is using LoRa to in- incorporate this. And if you can do LoRa to incorporate MRL, that would just be a win across the board because you, if you want an elastic embedding, use the adapter. If you don't want an elastic embedding, just cut out the adapter and you're fine. Uh, you know, so maybe for our listeners, do you mind taking it? And well, uh, taking us through the math of Laura, I think it'd be a hard thing to yeah, just kind of. Sure. So uh, I think uh, uh, Laura at its core is, so let's say you have a bunch of layers of neural network. Let's say they are W1, W2, W3, and so on up to WL. What you're trying to do is for every single WI, you're trying to learn a delta WI. So it's just the weight difference in the future weight matrix. If there exists a new WI tilde, that's parameterized as WI plus delta WI. Okay, And your goal is to not change WI, but only to learn the extra information in delta WI. Okay, And delta WI typically is of the same shape as WI. So what's the point in doing this? Like you could just fine tune WI and like, you will be getting things fast, uh, things back. But it turns out uh, there is some observations on intrinsic dimensionality. Again, tying back to MRL, minimal description length. There's a huge can of worms about, uh, I mean, you can even talk about Shannon's information theory. I don't want to get into that at this point. But what people realize empirically is that this delta WI is extremely low rank for a lot of downstream adaptations. I don't know if that would be the case for Matryoshka, but in general, this delta WI is now reparameterized as UI times VI, where UI and VI are extremely low rank matrices. Typically, it's an eight rank matrix. If if you consider your WI matrix to be something like 1024 to 1024, you are actually not storing 1024 by 1024, which is a million parameters, but you are actually storing only 16,000 parameters if you have an eight rank matrix uh, factorization. So million to 16,000, you fine tune, you are only updating the 16,000 parameters. And so whenever you need this uh, fine tune model, you just take these adapters, plug them into WI. So WI plus Delta WI is now your WI tilde and you do your inference. And that's pretty much what LoRa is. And in context of Matryoshka, when you're doing fine tuning, what I'm saying is take a pre-trained BERT model add these LoRa adapters with the Matryoshka loss. These adapters understand how to warp the space to be uh, Matryoshka, and then you can choose not to use them if you don't want to use them. Okay, if I get the next question, I this makes me really interested in this kind of like linear adapter idea. Like maybe mm-hmm. I can just take the embedding out and I can... Part of what it's so exciting about this is maybe this can live in the WeVA database itself is if it could just be the one matrix multiplication to adapt the embeddings, is that wouldn't work? No, so uh, Matryoshka is not a linear. Uh, so if it were linear, SVD should solve it. So the simple counter argument is if it is a linear projection, all you need is a, a, a PCA or SVD and you should be able to decompose it. But because it's non-linear, it's actually a non-linear operation. So if you want to recover a Matryoshka back from the existing embeddings, you need to train it with a non-linear function and you kind of know how you're packing the information. That's the reason it is crucial to have raw data because raw data will help you learn things much faster than being in the embedding space. 
like there is no invariance as an embedding space that's what i'm trying to tell you if vvi database has a billion points there is no way you can know what is the uh, uh, rank ordering for every single document with everything else so you can kind of mimic it by saying let's take the first document i'll compute the distance for every other document and that is the order that needs to be maintained and now i take a non linear transformation say three layer neural network feed this embedding in and the output should be an embedding which preserves the ordering such that all the transformed embeddings also follow the same ordering it's a much harder problem to optimize compared to what zack said like if you have a bunch of data if you have hard negatives it's much much cleaner because you don't care about the ordering in itself as much as you care about the discrimination between good and bad and that will just organize the information in the right way uh, okay so if i'm recapping correctly um so Laura, where I've been introduced to, to it by using this low rank weight update to update large language models, but you can also use this for embedding models. And um, it's something that kind of gets integrated throughout the neural network. Yes. I mean, uh, it's not for large language. It can be for anything. Like adapters were first introduced for vision models by Neil Halsby in 2020, 2019. I don't remember correctly. So it's, it's agnostic. Like you can do it for any model. I, I have never seen people use it, LoRa for Matryoshka representations. I personally haven't tried it. So, but in case you want like super efficient fine tuning, maybe that's a way out. But to come back to the core point of all of this, with enough data, you can fine tune it. It does not matter what loss function you're using. With enough data, Matryoshka will just adapt itself. So that's, I mean, like I'm not expecting say Nomic or someone to retrain their pre-trained model because it's pretty expensive because it's pretty large. Like, you can't expect GPT-4 uh, base model. Like I, I don't know what the details of ADA-3 are. I'm pretty sure it's going to be initialized with a, a mass language, uh, sorry, a, a generative pre-trained model followed by a pre-fine tuning and a fine tuning phase. And you cannot expect them to retrain a three-month model with Matryoshka just because something came up. So yeah, it, it just works with... Ideally, it would work better with pre-training as well, but it doesn't matter at some point of time. Uh, amazing. Maybe Zach, you could take take it from here on. Um, so it sounds like this kind of like I'm really interested in these kind of like fine tuning APIs. Does does this kind of conversation inspire maybe like you know a fine tuning API for the gnomic embeddings and, and maybe with this kind of like you know adapter thing, it's not so expensive to fine tune. Yeah. No, I think that's a that's a great question. I think. Um... I think what you're getting at is like, can can these embedding models serve like the purpose is for everybody or do you need to fine tune it for your domain? Um, and I think that like, you know, from what I've seen and, you know, you know, just kind of my, my own experience is that like, if you have a hyper specialized domain, maybe it's in the medical field or the law, um, you're probably better off fine tuning or training your own models. Um, and I think that's like something that we're, you know, playing around with is, you know, trying to understand what are people's use cases, um, like, uh, you know, the, the, the backbone of, of Atlas, uh, which is Nomic's core product is, is this Nomic embed model. So, um, you know, it, I think the, the core thing that we're really, really excited about right now is just like being, uh, able to help people visualize their data and understand, you know, their data at a large scale. Um, and I think, you know, once we, you know, continue to have conversations with other people, I think, um, the, you know, whether or not people will, you know, actually want this is, is something that is, you know, something that we're, we're trying to answer now. I think that we will get to uh, eventually, but, you know, if you are a, an ML practitioner, you work at a company that, you know, has uh, specialized data, I think it's, it's probably worthwhile fine turning your own data on, um, this domain specific data. So you brought up something that I'm so curious about Nomic AI and now training embeddings is, uh, so my understanding is that to visualize your embeddings with Nomic Atlas, you first have to reduce the dimensionality, you know, a ton down to, I guess, two dimensions for it to run in the browser. And so if you're taking open AIs, yeah, I think the largest ones are now 3072, I think so. And so you would then have this like massive compression with TSNE. Is that is that maybe a part of the motivation of why Nomic Embed has uh, these matryoshka? Because say we have a you know two fifty six D, then we can uh, then we can uh, run TSNE down to two easier, <laughs> and you just linked a paper, so uh, I'm going to read the paper really quick. <laughs> but yeah, it... yeah, I, th I think that like uh, 
Uh, Matryoshka is, is interesting for, for Nomic in two ways. One, it's for uh, people using Nomic in bed, right? I think we, we uh, Aditya brought this up earlier, but like it helps obviously on the rag side, rag side of things, both storage and, you know, searching will be faster and, and cheaper. Um, you know, I think using smaller embedding or smaller size embeddings with small, uh, with a uh, slight performance uh, hit, but with a linear uh, decrease in memory is, is obviously a great, great uh, trade-off. And I think that's um, definitely something that we're excited about trying across, you know, the, uh, the Atlas stack and seeing like where we can fit this in. How can we make things move faster with, you know, uh, small performance hits, or if any. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, I think the main um, motivation, you know, as of, you know, two weeks ago was to just like, Okay, this is interesting, but like in production, how many people are going to actually use even at 768 is, is can be can be quite costly. Um, so can we can we reduce the dimensions and get a, a you know quality model out? Uh, amazing. If I can ask one more, so with the launch of Nomic embeddings, I thought it was like such a spectacular launch, especially as someone who kind of like you know Thank Zane you. and I are always doing the social media thing and, and trading notes on you know how people launch things and. So the the launch was. What do you think made it so successful? Was it the open sourcing of the data set, the tr the you know the training, the you know just kind of the novelty of a new player entering the embeddings? What was kind of the you know the 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 composition of things that you think made that resonate so much with the machine learning community? Yeah, I think um, for me, the thing that made it the most special, uh, you know, made it really an important project for me was just that like. Uh, this is replicable for, for people with, with the right compute. Um, you can go and use basically our recipe and retrain a model uh, uh, however you want. You can either replicate it, adapt to your own needs, um, which I found, uh, I think, really rewarding because I spent the last you know few months doing this myself, trying to figure out like, okay, what are the different trade-offs? What, what is going to hurt? What's going to help? I mean, kind of going in there, kind of in, into the weeds of, you know, both GitHub and, you know, papers on archive, trying to read between the lines of like what they, what they say they're doing versus what they are actually doing. Um, so I think that, you know, open sourcing the recipe was, I think, maybe one of the, the reasons that, that, that uh, helps, you know, characterize that. But you know, I, I don't know. I, I, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what people really care about um, versus, you know, uh, what, what they say they want. Yeah, I, I think for me, I think for me, someone looking from the outside in, what was really cool about your announcement, and then earlier that week, there was the Olmo announcement, the open language model announcement from Allen AI. What I really liked about these two announcements was that this is probably uh, one of the first times. Now, there are uh, open embedding models and open language models, but this is the first time where you can see from beginning to end what's going on in the trenches, right? Like, what data are you creating? How are you cleaning it? What are the training pipelines looking like? What worked? What didn't work? You can literally take Almo, you can take uh, Nomic Embed, and you can make a course out of them around how to train an embedding model, right? So... That's super exciting to me, yeah. at least uh, around around the open source initiative there. So that's what resonated with me, at least. Hmm. Amazing! I love when the stories, when you can find that flow of the stories too, and connecting it to Omo. Yeah, that's also cool. Uh, awesome. So uh, maybe if we could, okay. So I think kind of the next topic I want to bring up is. Uh, so Zane, maybe if we could ask this question that you had about, and we're kind of, and we're coming back into the technical details of Matryoshka, so back from the, you know, open source talk, but, um, this thing about the weightings of the vector of the chunks and yeah. how you optimize that, maybe Zane, if you could introduce the question. Yeah. So did you, you mentioned that you could even, and I didn't know this, but you mentioned earlier that you could even train the, the first chunk on one loss function and then add it to another loss function. This is super interesting. Um. How would you, let's say you do that, how would that modify how you weigh the first chunk with the second chunk and the third chunk? Zach mentioned that for their training, they kept it all kind of consistent. You can weigh them all equally, but you mentioned in your paper that you, we can even search to identify what the right weightings are. And you can almost think of it as hyperparameter optimization to find, find this out. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think uh, Zach's use case and typically all the use cases use the same loss function. So there's no harm in using the same weighting. And as he mentioned, like if you reweight something, sometimes you run into the problem of losing accuracy on um, um, the, the free stuff or the more accurate stuff. Like something happens. I really don't understand it fully either. So 
uh, coming to um, the variable losses like if you have different losses i really don't know what the right weighting is but there exists a right weighting you need to find for it uh, so instead of thinking of it as a hyperparameter problem you can think of it as uh, an ada boost style problem so think about it as if you're learning a weight for each of the vector and the residual is going to be learning an additional weight of a different kind of vector so you're practically learning how much you are going to weight your metric space in each of these spaces so let's say the first 16 dimensions your spherical embeddings are worth six times more than the next 16 dimensions you're practically basically learning how to reweight them and there is a work of mine which shows that you can kind of learn these things without reinforcement learning i am not sure how reliably we can scale this at this point i need to test it out more before doing but yeah hyperparameter search works just fine so the nice way of doing it is you just take a small set of data to fine tune just search for hyperparameters very quickly on those things and then you can scale it up to larger scale and the scaling is very reliable so you can just use it for those purposes so this links back to what you mentioned earlier. There was a post on Twitter. I can't remember by who now, but they looked at the variability on the different dimensions as a proxy of how much information the that dimension was encoding. And they, yeah. it was almost like this ladder of you have really uh, informative dimensions and then less informative and then even less informative dimensions. Yeah. Um, do you think that you could potentially use that to understand how much to weigh the individual loss functions? Uh, yeah, I mean, like there's so much postdoc analysis you can do. Uh, I mean, even in the paper, we talk about something called adaptive classification, where you show that if there is a perfect routing mechanism, you can solve the same accuracy as a 2048 dimensional vector with 37 dimensions. So that is your expected cost or expected dimensionality of your entire task. Uh, but the problem is, how do you learn this routing is a very hard problem. I, I just... <laughs> I mean, like, there is enough information to barely get you to, like, half. So this is the same problem with mixture of experts, right? Like, Barrett's off, William Fedus, uh, Noam Shazir, all of these people tried so much, figured out so many things to make mi mixture of experts be more efficient. But in even in their case, each expert is same cost. Here, the each expert is not the same cost. So think about it as, as if each of the dimensions is its own expert. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Like, there is some other additional information we probably need to train these models such that you can leverage them fully. But yeah, I mean, like approximate nearest neighbors, etc., where there are some properties we can, you kind of preserve. So let's say if you preserve your recall with 32 dimensions and 128 dimensions, who cares? Just cluster with 32 dimensions and for precision, you can go for back to your 128 dimensions. So I don't know. It's, it's mostly experimental at this point, uh, but I think there will be some science at some point of time. Uh, I mean, Technically, we also kind of look at this from a theoretical perspective. There is some theory towards this. We just don't know what it is perfectly, but yeah. The the other thing that um, you mentioned in your paper, which I found like unbelievable. So it, maybe I can ask a, a question here. So you mentioned that, let's say we train on 32 dimensions and then 64 dimensions and 128 dimensions. The information diffuses between the dimensions as well. So if I use like 75 dimensions, how does that even work? Like I read okay. that and I was like, what's happening here? I think that that's actually like, if you ask me what's the coolest part of all of these things, that's yeah. the coolest part of all of these yeah. things. And I have a very weird intuition behind it. A lot of people don't get it is i mean like when when i wrote the paper i i had only this intuition in mind so there is this paper called um um uh, diffused redundancy or like no, no no this is not the paper so there is a paper by daniel Saudry, like he's a theoretician where they argue that sgd basically diffuses information across all the dimensions equally so if you train for a spherical embedding in 2048 dimensions there is no subset of 20 dimensions you can pick reliably such that this 20 dimensions is more accurate than anything else. Okay. So what it is trying to say is like old school feature selection. There is no way you can do feature selection in this 2048 dimensional space, which is uniformly good across everything. Okay. So what this is indirectly saying is the marginal utility of every dimension is equal. So let's say your accuracy is 70% and you have 1000 dimensions it's 70 by 1000 for every single one of them okay 
Now let's come to Matryoshka, right? In Matryoshka, what it is trying to do is like, let's say 32 dimensions has to achieve the same 70% accuracy. It will not, but it will achieve 69% accuracy. So the marginal utility of every single one of these 32 dimensions, 69 by 32. It's not anymore like 70 by 1000. And then if you go to 64 dimensions, the 64 dimensions is almost reaching 70%. So the marginal utility of every single dimension is whatever the marginal utility of 32 is, and remaining of that, like the 1% is diffused across all of these things. And it's a uniform split because there is no ordering in that space. Okay, the 64, like the extra 32 dimensions are good. So when you pick 48 dimensions, you're basically adding 69% plus half of the 1% of information somehow. Okay, it that might not sense. be exactly half, but it will be somewhere around half because by the information diffusion uh, 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 argument, there is no dimensionality which is more important or less important between 33 and 64. All of them are equally important because they do not have an importance loss on them. Okay, okay. so you nice. repeat the same argument across everything. All you're doing is you're adding less marginal utility dimensions, but you're adding them in chunks and the chunks have enough information in each of them that they will interpolate between both of those two. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So you get you get the initial uh, advantage of the higher uh, higher information dimensions, and then if you choose to use half of the second chunk, you get the utility. You half the utility, and then the marginal effect of whatever's left over. And this is why you believe that you get this information that's diffused evenly in yeah. the dimensions, and you can use whatever yeah. chunk. Okay. And uh, this should answer your future question if there is one about why the log separation or exponential separation of granularities yeah. instead of uniform separation because the accuracy is log linear so you can solve 70 percent of your task with 16 dimensions so there is no harm in you just doing 16 32 64 because the marginal utility is increasing log linearly so yeah. you can just like chunk them out into exponentially spaced things and the in interpolation between each of these interpolation has the same value eventually. So eight dimensions in the initial eight dimensions are more valuable than 32 dimensions later in the day. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Uh, super cool. So and, I have, oh, sorry, you have one more thing. And, and uh, like just, just to add, this also is why if you read the ADAN's paper, you see that the product quantization and other quantization stuff is better on lower dimensional representations because Clustering is easy in lower dimensional space. Okay. Even if you have 69% on 32 and like 70% on 1024, if you want to cluster 1024, it's much harder. So if you can cluster 256 to get to like PQ of 16 bytes and like from 1024 to 16 bytes, it's much easier for you to get to 16 bytes with lesser accuracy drop because 256 is more amenable. And it's also packed such that there is a lot more information there. So when you go to higher dimensionalities in MRL, there is mostly noise which is being diffused there. So it becomes harder for it to cluster and like make any sense out of it. So you are better off using a low dimensional embedding sometimes for better quantization and better uh, trade off in general. I think this is related to what I asked you, Zach, earlier. When you say uh, better clustering, I assume you don't mean like the speed of K means or HDB scan. I think you mean like the, the way that the clustering preserves the semantic region can, can we open up a little more about like what is good clustering like what what would make a clustering good or, I've, I've asked the same question when we had martin grutendorf on the podcast who's created bert topic we were asking the same question you know like they they uh you know produce a atlas style visualization and then within each of the clusters you like summarize them and so it's like how do we evaluate kind of the quality of clustering with wikipedia you know unstructured text and yeah i hope this question isn't <laughs> but. Yeah, sorry is this is this for me or a detail oh no, it's for you i guess yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, sorry i, I wasn't sure um yeah so i guess like in terms of um how we think about it uh especially with uh in terms with the tc a lot of the way that uh, people measure tc style algorithms is uh basically neighborhood preservation so you take um a random selection uh, or a random point in high dimensions uh, you get like a group of neighbors uh and then you you do your dimensionality reduction uh, algorithm and then you basically count you know how many points 
in that uh, local neighborhood in 2D are still preserved from from the high dimension. And that, that, that's basically like how a lot of these dimensional reality uh, reductions uh, algorithms are, are really um, measured. Um, so th that's kind of the way that we, we think about how, you know, things are clustered. Um, you know, Nomic, uh, has our own proprietary, uh, dimensionality reduction that's much more scalable and, and faster, um, than, you know, your usual TC. Um, and that, that's basically the basis of how we, you know, measure these, these trade-offs that, that we take. Hmm. That's a really nice nugget, Zach. I'm really glad to add that to my <laughs> understanding of these things, the preserving of the neighbors and the original dimensionality, yeah. That's really cool. And so I have one more question about embedding visualization for you, Zach, is you're training embedding models. And are you like, you know, I think earlier we were talking about kind of hyperparameter tuning and, you know, maybe a Bayesian optimization on the weighting of the different segments. And so I'm curious what visualizing the embedding space in Atlas adds to the training of embedding models. Is there maybe like a callback where you, you know, you send the latest, you know, Epoch 2 and then you re-embed all the data, visualize it in Atlas and you use that to kind of monitor how the training is going? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a, that's a good question. I think um, with, with something uh, like looking at visualizations, there's no like real, I, I mean, there are, you know, some uh, quantitative measures, but it's a little bit more qualitative. So a lot of the times that when we were training these models, we would, you know, take a checkpoint, embed, you know, a selection of documents and upload and see basically, you know, what is going on? Does this make sense? Are, you know, things about sports near sports or things about like science near other documents of science? So it's a nice, uh, another way to check versus just like looking at a, a number like MTEB, um, mm. which, you know, maybe doesn't paint the whole picture. Um, yeah, I think that uh, in terms of like how we used it, it, it uh, Atlas played a bigger part in actually the, the data curation. It's really helped uh, us find like clusters of data that were out of distribution. So, for example, mm -hmm. when we're curating this like 250 million uh, uh, paired data set, um, you know, the, this stuff will fall through filters that, you know, that are handwritten. Um, you know, uh, for example, sometimes there'll be uh, stuff that's written in half English, half, you know, uh, another language, and there'll be like outlier clusters on the outskirts of the map. So they're, they're like clearly different. So those are places where we'd go in and circle and like uh, tag the points and then remove them from the data set. Um, so I think that that played a bigger role in terms of just actually looking at the data and, and curating a clean data set so we could train these models. Yeah, I think that also has a major role in like these kind of like LLM observability or maybe like RAG observability where you're kind of like plotting your queries in the space and you, maybe you have like, you know, they're all over here and the queries like here. So you like go collect more data over there. And yeah, I think that's a huge application of this stuff. Uh, so maybe, you, oh, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I really like the visualization and like the metric space. So like from, because I'm not in this space, the way I look at it is slightly different. All I do is just like go and like look at recall <laughs> and uh, often like if the cluster and like su surprisingly there are some interesting measures like not a lot of people use um, uh, but there's something called relative contrast which was introduced in 2012. Uh, there's some interesting mechanistic measures of how good a clustering could be even without clustering and yeah like kind of they make sense but I would ideally like to see visualizations as Zach is mentioning. I think it's much easier for me to just like write a code and like look at a metric number, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it could also be so cool to visualize the matryoshka, like the you have the visualization of the 32 dimensions, then two for these, I don't know if it goes down to 32. I'm pretty sure if you do nomic stuff, like like I know that fa like very famous GIF of no nomic, right? So you have GPT-4 embeddings and like they just like warp the space into it. I really just want to see like 32, 64, 128. How do they just like warp? Like are they even moving around? If they're moving around, why are they moving around? That would be nice to see. Yeah, I think it's, no, I, we we definitely have the embeddings for that. I think uh, we could definitely put a map together that, that looks like that. I, I mean, like, really that cool. would be so nice so that, like, people who are not believers would understand, like, hey, look, the extra, uh, like, as Zane was asking, right, like, what does the extra dimensions add? And you can see that the core of the cluster will not change. It's the long tail accuracy that will increase as you go to the higher dimensions. And, like, where is that one point flipping its cluster from? So is it, like, something moving from away from the space or uh, like if it is moving from far away from the space that means there's information in the rest of the 64 or 128 dimensions which is helping it move and if it's just flipping 
from one adjacent cluster to the other adjacent cluster. It just means that the magnitude is changing enough that the distance function just flips into the clustering of this side than the other one. This is actually something that I was thinking about just today. I, I found a data set that was embedded using the uh, open, uh, sorry, the old OpenAI embeddings and the and the new ones that are uh, MRL based. And so I thought, what if you visualize, like you look at what the chunks are, you, you would have to first look at the this like Ooh. ladder step thing of where they actually chunked before they trained. And then if you just take those chunks, you visualize what you learn uh, in those embedding spaces, that would be pretty cool. But uh, maybe Zach, I can reach out to you afterwards and we can, we can talk about what we can do there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely reach out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's another one I'd love to see is like sentence level versus paragraph level, like visualizing chunking in, in the embeddings. And awesome. So I have an anchoring question. I have to, well, it's not necessarily an anchoring question to everyone. Maybe we'll then do one of those. But Aditya, I'm so curious about your work on differentiable end to end ANN indexes. And, you know, I'm sure our WeVA, you know, podcast listeners will love this topic. Uh, could you please explain that research? Yeah, so I think the idea is very maybe I, I don't think I can present right because it's a podcast. <laughs> okay, anyway, I think like life is very easy here. So, uh, so let me put it this way. So the way retrieval works right now, Zach, correct me if I'm wrong, is you have an encoder model which takes in a data point, gives you a d-dimensional vector. Okay, once you have this collection of d-dimensional vectors, you create an offline index using approximate index neighbors so that your life is easier when you when a query comes in and you have to match it to the most relevant documents okay so think of this index as if it's the index in your front page of your book and it's actually a tree very similar to what it is or a graph you can think of it as multiple ways okay so that's how it is done right now and it's not end to end differentiable like uh, uh, the and embedding model does not know that it's going into an approximate nearest neighbor uh, uh, index and the approximate nearest neighbor index, mathematically, all it has to do is preserve the metric space. So all it is trying to do is like, if I do this approximation, my distance metric and the ordering should be preserved. That's pretty much what it does. Nothing nothing fancier than that. Uh, there are some bounds for it, et cetera, et cetera. But like, let's, let's ignore about that. However, because these two are not trained together, it's, it's a sad problem that all of the queries you ask will get the same amount of time to get to the final leaf nodes because it's a balanced tree. So there is no notion of head queries or tail queries. There is no notion of something like <coughs> what's the capital of US versus something which is very, very rare. You need one to be much faster. The other one should be much slower. And currently people do this like at Google or Bing. There are knowledge bases for quick lookups, etc. to make this cacheable, etc. However, you want to learn these things, but like there's enough information about uh, DC being the capital of US. So you should you should learn that and put it in the closest neighbor. So you spend like 10 mega flops getting to that. And for a very rare thing, like a, a popular athlete in Vietnam in this space, uh, like there's a game called Sepak Takra. Sepak Takra is a very South Asian game and there is no way Westerners would know about it. And if you want to go and like search for those people, you should be able to spend 100 mega flops finding the right document rather than using just like, 50 megaflops or 10 megaflops. And where does this 100 megaflops come from? It comes from whatever you're saving from serving the head queries by at 10 megaflops. So you are basically using the fact that things are Ziphian and you're going to make it anisotropic in the amount of compute you're going to use for each of these things, such that the rare example gets more compute. How do we ensure this? That's where end-to-end -end differentiability comes in. So you can train this embedding model and the approximate data neighbor structure all together in an end-to-end -end differentiable fashion. Like this is a very, very simple way of doing it. Like you can parameter a tree as a differentiable structure, uh, uh, model it as a contrastive loss, as Zach mentioned, have negatives, hard negatives, hard negatives go into the farthest leaf node, uh, uh, the query and document which are relevant go into the same leaf node, etc. However, this still has the inductive as that you need to tell them before in hand what the approximate data neighbor structure is. Right. So let's take a step back and think about how you organize information in the web. Let's say you have a billion documents. The dumbest way of organizing this is have a billion uh, dimensional vector where an active bit means that that's the index of the document. So something like one, all zeros is the first document, 
zero, one, all zeros as the second document and so on. So it's a one hot encoding. It's very inefficient. So that's where approximate nearest neighbor came in and said, if you build a tree structure on it, uh, you can build a logarithmic structure rather than a linear structure. Uh, however, if you think about this tree, like let's just think about binary tree, right? It has a left child, right child, left child, right child, and keeps going down. Assign the left child a zero and the right child a one. Okay. When you go to the leaf node, every single data point has a binary code assigned to it, which is multi-hot. It's not one hot anymore. Okay, so this problem is called error correcting output codes, and it's a, a theoretically hard problem, uh, which was proposed in 1995, and there is no way of solving this. This is NP-hard. Okay, so what people started doing is they started using side information, say something like external taxonomy, like WordNet, to build this tree and use these binary codes. Or they used to realize that if you have large enough random code book, like you are assign random codes, they're separable enough that you can just learn this. So my question was, can I learn this without any external side information? And the answer was, when you're training your representation learning pipeline, like your embedding model, you have a, a embedding followed by a linear classifier, which is trying to map it to either if it belongs to this instance or label somehow, like it's a cross entropy loss, where you're trying to say it's one versus all. So it's basically contrasting that something is closer to everything else. So you indirectly have a hash function in the column of your classifier. Just look at the linear classifier. So you're going from D dimensions to L dimensions and each of your L dimensional columns, sorry, D dimensional columns, which are L in number, is a real value equivalent of a hash like it's not realizable but it's a hash okay if you hash that you should be able to get a cluster so what if i make this d-dimensional vector binary it's just plus one and zero so when during your training you can ensure that your classifier becomes only takes only the values of plus one and zero with an approximation called straight through estimator okay what happens with this is the embeddings which you're training also become plus ones and zeros like they're aligned with the sign of your, uh, so ideally it's not actually plus one and zero. You do plus one and minus one and you can re reparameterize it to plus one and zero. But that's pretty much it. So now what you have is a document comes in and you output a D-dimensional binary code. Okay. You do not need to build an approximate nearest neighbor because the approximate nearest neighbor is a hash lookup. So you're doing an order one lookup whenever you want. Now imagine that you can do the same thing in the embedding space, but add Matryosh on top of it. So now if you have say a 20 bit code, and if I ensure that the first four bits are nested inside the eight bits are nested inside the 16 bits, all you're doing is a hierarchical hash such that you can do prefix matching or hash lookups in the first four bits, then go into the locality, do another hash lookup and so on. So you are building a tree structure without telling it's a tree structure and it's all in binary space. And if you use like say something like 128 bits or 64 bits, it's more than enough to encode everything in the universe. So there is no inductive bias. So as data comes in, it just keeps figuring out what data goes into the lower bits and what data goes into the higher bits. And if you know how to route it properly, you can solve 80% of your tasks with like eight bits and then you can keep adding stuff. So you can do your entire uh, uh, equitable serving business based on the task hardness. And this is all end-to-end -end differentiable. So as data comes in, you don't need to refresh your index. In VV8, all of these vector databases, you have to refresh your index as the data comes in. Uh, like once in like a week or something, whenever there is more data or like you add them ad hocly at, at some of the leaf nodes or graph nodes. It's, it's much harder. It's better to rebuild everything once in a while. But in this case, the bit flips are the things only that matter. So you just like keep flipping the bits as things keep changing. And if you flip the bits right, right enough, and the bits only flip when there is a mass of data, which is actually changing everything. So think about Christmas gifts are being relevant in winter. So they need to have eight bits or four bits. But when you go to summer, they should eventually figure out that they need to use like 64 bits because they're not at all relevant anymore. So as the data comes in, the query comes in, they flip, 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 flip to become that they are the long tail, but they are still in the memory and they'll come back to be being in the cache when there is more data which is relevant to them. 
Amazing. Okay, so I'll take a first step at it. I'm sure Zane has some thoughts too. But uh, so, I, so to me, it sounds like sort of entangling IVF clustering style indexes or maybe like KD trees with yes. Matryoshka. It gives you a really nice kind of routing property. Um, and, and yeah, I, for, I really appreciate how you explained that. You kind of like came really in and then out again and again. <laughs> and I love recording these podcasts. So I get to re-listen to that. But um, what do you think about like a differentiable HNSW? Because my understanding is that HNSW, if, well, because you, you don't actually need to refresh the index. You can incrementally add data pretty nicely yeah. with HNSW. And yeah. Yeah. So I think HNSW is a great index for single machine things. I mean, like I really like graph based indices. They are probably the most accurate things out there. Uh, but even a graph based index is a DAG at some point of time. So you can parameterize even that into an adjacency matrix and that's all binary that's <laughs> all binary just think about it that way okay and uh, hnsw the biggest problem with hnsw is uh, uh, the locality of things so in case you want to scale up things like it's it's you want things to be in the ram uh, trees they, they don't have that problem you can spread things out based on leaf each of the leaf can reside on a different machine um, well, can uh, I interrupt you really quick? But then you need, but then how do you know which part to bring into memory? Like, that's the good thing, right? Because you can compute everything on that machine. So it would be like a distributed system index? Yes, it's a distributed oh, system. Okay. Uh, <laughs> graph yeah. is slightly more harder. <laughs> that's the thing. There are trade offs for everything. I just don't know what's the right. I really like the accuracies of graph. Like, I really like, even more than HNSW, I like this thing called DiskNN. Uh, it's a Microsoft thing. Yeah. I think that's probably the best uh, graph database uh, data structure out there. Uh, it's it's It doesn't have the hierarchical requirements at all. It's just single graph. Uh, they store a bunch of stuff in RAM. It just works fine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like you can do HNSW as well uh, by differentiable, but I haven't put particularly focused on it yet, but I am pretty sure you can do it because at the end of the day, all you are doing is learning an adjacency matrix. Yeah, and Zach, I'm sorry if we're going to be nerding out on HNSW for a little while, but I just have one more. Oh, I go have, ahead. Nice to hear. <laughs> I, I have to ask one more question about disk and and um, how does disk and and use the disk? <laughs> oh, yeah, like disk and is like I mean, you should. I don't know if Harsha will come on the podcast, but Harsha is like an amazing researcher who. So he was a systems researcher who realized this problem. Sometime when I was working with him, I did not work on disk NN, but in 2019, he realized this is an actual problem. And then they started working on it. So the disk NN, uh, they use disk by, from what I understand, I might be wrong. And like, uh, sorry, Harsha, if you're listening to this, is um, they asynchronously bring in the data during the compute. So they compute the distances using PQ. So it's approximate distances. And by the time you create your shortlist, by the time the compute is done, you can load the chunks of the data which are relevant by bringing like blocks of data. And all of this can be done asynchronously. So actually, the key behind this KNN is a technology called Blast on Flash, where you could do all of your matrix computations by putting the matrices on the disk and only like fetching relevant blocks into the memory. And when the computation is happening, you can you can asynchronously fetch the rest of the blocks. So the idea is very similar. So you can scale things up. So now that because everything can reside in SSD and SSD to RAM is extremely fast compared to HDD to RAM, you can use SSD as an extension of your RAM for all practical purposes. Because the speed between SSD and RAM can be leveraged by doing asynchronous updates. Hmm. Amazing. That really helped to clear, uh, click for me. And yeah, I also want to give a quick hat tip to Abdel Rodriguez at WeVA who does these kind of things for WeVA and he's such a wizard with these kind of things. And it's always, always like trying to keep up with him as he explains it, but you did a great job with that. Uh, awesome. So maybe a, an anchoring question. I know we've, this has been such a deep dive into everything we're working on. It's, it's hour packed with information. Um, maybe let me just do a round of like, what are we the, each the most excited about on the frontier of AI? Maybe uh, starting with Zach. Yeah, I think um, for for me and for Nomic specifically, I think uh, you know continuing to improve the embedding models is obviously top of mind. Um, whether that's multilingual, multimodalities, I think those are the two big uh, 
paths that we're, we're specifically excited about. I, I'm personally most excited about multimodality. I think there's been some interesting uh, papers recently that have come out, um, especially out of the, uh, the big vision group uh, at Google. They do really great work. Um, so I'm excited to see, uh, you know, how we can maybe adapt Novik Embed to other modalities. Um, uh, yeah. Amazing. Uh, Zane, do you want to take it from there? I know you've done a lot of awesome stuff with multimodal. Yeah, that that's definitely on the top of my list when I look forward. I think kind of morphing together multimodal embedding models with these uh, these um, language uh, and vision tuned uh, models to, to set up the multimodal rag and reasoning over images. I mean, with Gemini, you even have audio modalities in there now. I, I think that's really the way forward. I don't know if the current approach that groups have is the way to do it, where they just project everything into the same token space and then you reason over it with, with attention. I don't know if that's that scales, but I, I feel like that is the direction where we need to go. So that's what I'm super excited about. And, and we're, we're about to do a lot of work around this with, with Gemini and all these other uh, multimodal embedding and, um, and uh, language vision models. But that's probably what I'm most excited about in the space right now. Uh, amazing. Uh, Adia, could you take us home? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think uh, uh, Retrieval uh, is here to stay and it's it's good to see that people realizing that uh, in the last, like, shout out to all the chain companies like Langchain, Llama Index, like which kind of showed why Retrieval is important, uh, etc., I think uh, the future is probably adaptive systems where you keep adapting to the context, adapting to the temporal aspects. So you keep changing over time. As I mentioned, like things should change over time, come back. There is an external memory which can ground you. And if you can train all of these things end to end so that everything is informed about the others. So like as, as you guys were saying, like, yeah, like if you can use a pre-trained models create some sort of message message passing, get them aligned, and then you make everything go in tandem together. That would be nice. But given a chance, I would like to train everything together. Like Gemini is probably a good starting point. But I also want them to be aware of the grounded information, not just compressed information in their weights. And uh, Retro is a good starting point for that as well. But I want Retro to be completely differentiable with the external memory, and that would be great. So, yeah, I think I'm excited about, in general, about adaptive compute. And adaptive can be a lot of things. And, yeah, some of those things are what we talked about today. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Zane, Zach, Aditya, thank you so much for joining the WeVA podcast. I thought this one was just absolutely packed with information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. This was great. Awesome.